At last, Britain is stepping out into space. For 10 years, her scientists have listened enviously to the signals from Russian and American spacecraft. Signals that supply new knowledge for their own scientists, while the rest of the world has stayed firmly rooted to the ground. Britain's giant radio telescope at Jodrell Bank was completed just in time to hear the first ever satellite, Sputnik, launched by the Russians in October 1957. Now, Jodrell Bank can tune into its own experiment as UK3 circles the Earth. UK3 is a name given to the first spacecraft built entirely in Britain. Its purpose is scientific inquiry into the forms of radiation which come from outer space. To collect these, the satellite is expensively covered in gold plate. This device is to sniff the ozone 300 miles up for the weathermen. It's one of five different experiments in the satellite from universities and government research stations and from Jodrell Bank. All the equipment depends on electricity generated from the sun's rays. Over the next year, the results of the experiments should be coming back to Earth by radio. Over three years of planning, designing, building and testing have gone into the production of UK3. It's part of an Anglo-American program launched into orbit by an American rocket. But before being shipped across the Atlantic, the satellite had to prove under test that it would stand up to all the rigors of life in outer space. Wherever the satellite went, this caravan went with it. It was fully equipped to monitor the electronic performance of the satellite when under test. Apart from having to work in a complete vacuum, UK3 will have to spend its life spinning like a top, its aerial swung out by centrifugal force. Although this is one of the easiest ways of keeping it stable, the satellite has to be delicately balanced right down to the last rivet. UK3 went to the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough for any tests which its makers, the British Aircraft Corporation, could not do themselves. This test is to find out, among other things, just how strong is its magnetism, so that allowances can be made for it. Some tests, needing very expensive equipment, like this giant vacuum chamber, are to answer very simple questions. For example, in outer space, just how hot or cold will the satellite get? Remember that every two hours, it swings from blazing sunlight into icy cold shadow behind the Earth. And delicate instruments like tape recorders and transmitters will only work properly at room temperature. The engineers had to juggle their design to make sure that UK3, spinning in outer space, would radiate and absorb just the right amount of heat. The giant vacuum chamber proved them right. The other satellite, ESRO-2, is made by Hawker Siddeley Dynamics, who won the contract in the teeth of European competition. Years of work could be wasted by the slightest speck of dust, so no chances are taken. The assembly area is even pressurized to keep dust out. This satellite uses French electronics and carries experiments from Holland, France and Britain. Like UK-3, it was destined to be launched by the same sort of American rocket. It's about the same weight, 180 pounds, and uses the sun's rays for electricity. In this case, the makers have been much more sparing with the gold plate, but the price is still more than a million pounds. It's the work and testing needed to achieve absolute reliability that costs the money. This is the nerve center. It issues 37 different commands, anything from spin a little faster, please, to measure these cosmic rays. But most experiments will be looking at the sun, and especially at the sun spots. These will soon be at their 11-year peak, and scientists are anxious to find out just what really happens.
The French will measure the streams of charged particles and the Dutch, the X-rays, which these huge storms on the sun's surface pour out into space. One hundred and ten minutes of results are stored on a tape and they can be played back to Earth through the gold-plated radio transmitter in two minutes flat. Lamps to imitate sunlight test out the solar cells. There are 3,500 of them, each generating a tiny current when the sun shines on them. Carefully wired up, they provide the satellite with 50 watts, about the same power as the average light bulb. But a satellite's early life is a continuous journey from one test to another. Since launching it into orbit costs the best part of a million pounds and there's no way of repairing it once it's up there, everything has to be exactly right. Since it'll spend its life spinning, it has to be balanced with correcting weights, just like a car wheel. But for a satellite, ordinary lead weights won't do. They have to be gold or at least gold plated. One of the problems is not to over test. Too much testing can weaken the satellite so much that launching it is the last straw and it breaks down on the very occasion it shouldn't. But after all the meticulous preparations, the satellite must pass a final test. Will it stand up to the rough ride it'll get when the rocket takes it up? Using a flashing light to view the structure, the vibrations appear to slow down, and in this way, the tester gets advance warning of trouble to come. This, in particular, is a test that shouldn't be overdone, and as a precaution, no fewer than eight copies of Ezro 2 were manufactured. The chosen satellite, now being put into its container for the journey to America, is ready for a year of useful life in outer space. At the end of that year, she'll be switched off to provide radio space for more spacecraft. Then, Ezro 2 will be just one more addition to the 2,000-odd pieces of hardware already gliding silently through space. Although Britain has been a late starter in the manufacture of satellites, the experience is valuable, and it's an industry with a big future, especially in communication satellites. There's a sting in the tail, though. The spectacular scale of the American space industry proves a big temptation to British engineers, a number of whom accompanied the satellites to the launching pad in California. When the satellites are launched into outer space, they don't come down, and joining the brain drain, engineers have been known to take off too.